Uh, it's a little slow getting started with COVID and everything that's going on, but we're really hoping that we'll get a lot more involvement so that people can just drop by and ask questions. Uh, on the 3rd of November, we're having sort of an open session, which we have stuff we can talk about, but it's going to be open for any student who wants to come in and ask questions uh, that we can answer. And maybe we'll play some professor. Uh, see if you can find questions that we can't answer. I, I was thinking about starting that and having it uh, give away a, a gift card for coffee, and I may still do that. But the idea is to uh, give you one more resource where you can join a community that is focused on research. Even the faculty will get to talk about their research and problems they've had, issues they've overcome. Um, tips that they have for students. And mostly we're going to find out that from discipline to discipline, methodology changes. So while I'm primarily from the humanities, uh, I do work in interdisciplinary studies because I do indigenous, global indigenous studies. I also work a little bit in uh, social science. And so the methodology I use is one of integrative methodology. And that takes one or two methodologies, different fields, blends them together into something sort of unique. So instead of going straight by the path, um, I get to use information from all kinds of disciplines. And, and that makes it a bit easier for me, uh, but it also makes it more difficult when you're going about how to do your papers. So what we're going to do today, and this is uh, sponsored by the ESU Undergraduate Research Council, and you'll see some of them here, and we're going to start podcasts as well uh, to try and get us a little bit more visible. The purpose is to just give you some ideas. Now, with all the ideas that we give you, we want to put a caveat in there and say you need to make sure that you are checking your discipline and the methodology in your discipline, because what we give you is just sort of generalized information. Uh, and, and so you're going to need to make sure that you understand, we were talking before we started, about the difference in citations. So how citations are done in one discipline may not carry over to another. Even within one discipline, for example, I know in philosophy, when I publish, they can require MLA, APA, or Chicago. And there's no way I can remember all of those, especially with all the new changes they put in. So we have Purdue OWL. We have the websites with the style sheets in them. And you can go and look up. And those, those style sheets, they come in book form, too. I have one. Um, they tell you everything you would ever need to know about researching, about writing, and about publishing. So if you have a question and you just need a quick resource, go to the style sheet, go to APA or Chicago or MLA, whichever one you're using, and search the question, and they'll have an answer for you. So that's the beauty of those. The, the problem with those is that they change them from time to time, and so you have to keep up with them. Purdue Owl does a pretty good job of keeping up with the most current. I'm less worried about the most current citation format in my classes. Others are more so, and I understand that, and especially if you have one specific style sheet that you use. You need to really know that one. All right, so let's get started on some things. Today we're talking about sources. And when we're talking about sources, again, most of the time we're talking about academic sources which are peer-reviewed journals or books. Uh, in other words, we don't want websites. We don't want uh, dictionaries or encyclopedias, uh, no wiki anything. I know there are, are, now there are some professors that are going to say it's OK to use these. Ask your professor. Generally speaking, though, when we're talking about scholarly journals or scholarly material, we're talking about things that have been peer-reviewed. That means that They've gone through a process of people reading their works, and they may not agree with what they say, but they do agree that the work was done legitimately in that field. 
And so when you go through peer reviewing, they'll send it out. It's usually blind reviewed. They send back issues. And sometimes you get uh, good peer reviews, and sometimes you get horrible peer reviews. I, I had a couple that uh, one said that it was an international journal, and they said that my article was not fit for their journal because there was no uh, racism in, in pedagogy, the study of uh, teaching. And I thought, well, you know, it hurt. It was sad. But then the more you think about it, it's like, wow, how can they not see that there are problems here? I had another one that just recently. Um, I must have been on the mark because one of my readers was so infuriated by what I wrote that the reader just it came off the rails. There's nothing of value here, although the reader said quite clearly that my research was done correctly and done well, and I'd obviously done a great deal of research. Uh, all that was positive, but nothing I had to say was of value. It should never be printed. When you get something like that, you have to sort of step back. It's, it's going to hurt, but you got to step back and say, wait a minute. And as I read it more carefully, it appears that a couple of things I said may have stepped on some toes in ethnography. And um, I can certainly understand that because while I was not talking against ethnography, I was talking from an indigenous perspective about indigenous methodology. And so that could have been very upsetting for somebody. And I think that may have been where it was. So they, they sent it out for more peer reviews. All the rest of them came back. They liked it. Um, so you sort of have to take all that with a grain of salt. But what you know then when you get that article is it has been peer reviewed. People in the field have said this is legitimate work. And so you can use it as a resource. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking for when we're looking for sources. Now, JSTOR and Galileo are good. Uh, Google Scholar I would be very careful of. Uh, our research librarians, if you get stuck, they're the best. Uh, I remember a while back I had this um, issue of the star child from ancient Persia. Somebody asked me about it and I said, yeah, there, there is something here and I couldn't remember and I couldn't find it. I contacted the research librarian within a couple of days. They found what I had known about 20 years before. I just could not place the reference. So definitely use your resource librarians. Now, again, I'm just giving you some tips here. They're going to change from discipline to discipline. And um, there's something to think about. But here's something I want people to think about. It occurred to me, and I've taught for 36 years now at the university level, um, people tend to do research backwards. So a lot of times students will try and figure out their thesis statement before they do the research. And I understand that in, in some political science and social sciences that you are supposed to have your research question. And, and I get that, but I think it may still help in forming those research questions to do your research first. So I always encourage people to take a broad topic and then go see what they find. So if they're doing something on um, indigenous cultures that they put in maybe um, women and indigeneity or something like that, it's a very broad topic and, and a 10 page paper, you cannot cover that. You're going to need to narrow it down. But what you want to do is narrow it down after you've seen what everybody else talks about, after you find out what's out there, because that makes it so much easier to write your paper. Then you're not going out searching for resources that will back up what you're saying. You are looking at everybody else's resources. You're figuring out what the scholars in the field have said. And then you're narrowing it down to the papers that you want. And at that point, so for instance, in my classes, I usually make them have at least eight sources, eight academic sources. And for those new to research who don't necessarily have a, a strategy for how to do this, I usually tell them, first thing you want to do, read all your sources. 
then go back and you're going to go through them at least another two or three times. And as you do that, if you have a piece of paper for every single source you have, and on that paper you're asking yourself the same questions. In interdisciplinary studies, they tell you to ask who, what, when, where, why, and how of each article. You can also write down um, things like uh, what so or what scholarship did they use? That is, what theories did they use? Uh, what topics did they cover, the main topics? What was their conclusion? What is their reasoning process? Whatever your questions are that you want to deal with, if you have a piece of paper for every single source that you're using and you answer those questions for every single source, then when you lay those papers out in front of you, you will be able to very easily compare and contrast your papers. In other words, you can take your sources and put them in conversation. At that point, you can start narrowing your topic to one or two ideas for a 10-page paper, one or two ideas, and see how all these people fit together. Some say they agree with it, but they change it a little bit. Others say they disagree with it, and here's why. Now you have a conversation going between your sources. And that's what you want to start with your outline. So then you can start looking at, I want to talk about these three things. And a lot of people, and I apologize because I was going to have visuals with this, but not with the computer problems I'm having. Um, a lot of people make their outline. They hate making outlines, and they, they say, well, they don't do any good. I think that's because they've never been taught how to use them. You can make an outline, and you go, you know, Number one, introduction. Number two, history. Number three, problem. Number four, solution. However you want to do it. And then you start putting in all the information. Well, most people only put in one word. Uh, and that is not a very helpful outline. That is kind of an exercise in futility because it doesn't tell you anything. That's sort of a, a rough draft for an outline. What you want to do is once you have all your information on your pages, you want to go back to that outline and take each of your sources and put them in the outline exactly what that source says about that area, area A, B, or C. You also want to in include all of the quotes you, you want to use, indirect quotes as well as direct quotes. And that way, by the time you're finished, you will have about a three-page detailed outline so that when you sit down to, to write, you're just following everything that's there. Now, you can't overdo this. Um, I usually tell students for a 10-page paper, three to five pages of an outline uh, is good. Because then when you're writing it, it's basically all written for you. You've had a conversation with your sources, and you've had a conversation with your outline going, no, I don't really like this here. I can move it up here, and it's more impactful or I want to add more here because now that I'm looking at my outline, I don't have any sources up here, but I have them all down here. So maybe I don't need that top part, or maybe what I need to do is split this bottom part into two different sections. So when you make your outline detailed, you, you really can actively be involved in writing your paper. And I think a lot of times students don't feel empowered when they write. They're, they're sort of passively going through it. If you can actively be involved in it, you get to choose how you present the material, what you focus on, um, what words you want to use directly, and it's going to make the process easier. I do have one student, and, and she's okay with me not telling her name, telling the story, because uh, it's pretty funny. Every time she writes me a paper, even if it's like a 10-page paper, she'll have about a 12-page outline. I mean, she goes through and makes this outline so detailed that literally when she sits down to write, it's sort of like filling in the transitions is all she has to do. Uh, her outlines are amazing and, and maybe a bit over the top. Uh, but it, the more detailed your outline is, the easier it is to use all your sources. So in a paper, you don't want to use just one main source. You want to use all the sources you have. Now you may use one or two more than others. But you don't want to just use one line out of a, a source. That isn't really giving the impression that you read that source. 
We also want to be very careful. While things on page one and two may be helpful, we don't really want to cite only page one and two of every article because the idea there is you didn't read the whole thing. Similarly, you don't want to just um, cite the conclusion because it looks like you only read the conclusion. So your citations need to be from throughout the, the articles to show that you have a good understanding of what's going on, to show that you've read the whole thing. And then they need to be fit in where they work, not just here's a bunch of quotes and um, I'm throwing them in there. You want to actually use quotes that support your point and advance your argument, uh, advance your discussion. So your outline should be active, not passive. Um, I don't want these to be too uh, long, so I do want to say one thing about sources that I think uh, the plagiarism issue, and I'm not sure why students have such a difficult time with plagiarism. Uh, maybe it's because it was drummed into my head in undergraduate, uh, I can say back in my day, but it's true, back in my day, um, I went to a school as a private school, and if you had three mechanical errors, you failed, if there were major mechanical errors, you failed the paper entirely. And so, and it was required that you pass in order to graduate. So they drummed it in back then. We did an awful lot of grammar. We spent time and time and time and time in grammar. Um, that isn't so much anymore because there's so many things that we have to cover in our classes. So let me give you some sort of highlights on plagiarism, and everybody sort of agrees with these. Basically, direct quotes, you know you have to cite them. Everybody's good with that. Make sure you put in a page number, by the way. Uh, you need the page number for all things. For indirect quotes, you also have to cite those. You have to give a page number. So make sure that if you took anything from any other source, you are citing it. In other words, if you didn't make it up all brand new on your own, cite your sources, which does mean as an undergraduate level, you're probably going to cite quite a bit because you're not an expert in the field. Um, try not to go quote, 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 quote. You need to, research papers need to be about half and half, half research, half um, your evaluation, but your evaluation does not mean your opinion because you're not an expert yet. So you want to evaluate it by showing how people disagree with these concepts and agree with those concepts and how these concepts are inconsistent or consistent. So there's there's a lot that goes into that that we'll go into in another time. But you do want to cite everything you have, direct or indirect quote. No cutting and pasting, we get that. Um, it's just far too easy for people to catch these uh, plagiarism nowadays. I mean, after you've been doing this for so many years, you just sort of spot it. But we also have all these programs that will catch it for us. So it's it's almost not even worth attempting anymore. I do want to say one thing about indirect quotes. And that is that you cannot take information out of a source and just go to your thesaurus and take two or three words out of a sentence and put two or three words in. No, okay, that's an indirect quote. No, you still basically stolen the sentence structure. You have stolen the, the way the author has organized the sentence. So you have to pull something out of your research. You have to mull it around, think about it, put it in entirely different language, and put it back into your research. And if you're not sure you can do that, then I recommend you get a note card or another piece of paper and you write what you want to say and then go back and check and make sure that you didn't use more than like three or four words from your original source. And that includes and, the, of. If you do, direct quote it. I mean, if you can't say it any other way, use a direct quote. The last one, and I think this is where people uh, get a little bit confused. And that is when there is common use. And technically speaking, if something is common use, you don't have to cite it. And I say technically speaking because here's the caveat to that. What we know is that when you're an undergrad, you're just beginning your research. You're just beginning in your field. And so 
we aren't going to hold you to higher standards. We don't expect dissertations from you. Um, we expect you to write at your level. That means that what is common use, say in the field of philosophy, I probably know, but you may not. And so if you don't know whether it's common use or not, I would cite it or I would ask a professor uh, or call somebody who in the library or somewhere where you can say, what do I do about this? In the end, it doesn't hurt to quote it. It may hurt not to quote it. So be careful about that common usage stuff because you may know that the capital of the United States is in Washington. But if I ask you how many, you might know senators, how many people are in the House of Representatives, I bet you have to look it up. And if you have to look it up, it's not common use. It's not common knowledge. So common knowledge is tricky. And it comes with your scholarship as you advance, as you gain more scholarship, and as you gain more knowledge in your field, it comes with expertise. And it also comes with letters after your name. So you get the MA letters, you get a little bit more expertise, and they give you a little more leeway. You get PhD, you get a lot more leeway. If you've been doing this a long time, even more leeway. So be careful on the common used one. In, if you're ever in doubt, cite. Now, those are the, some of the tips I have on sources. Um, let me turn this back on. And again, I am having a little bit of trouble with hearing you. If you have questions, let's put them in the chat box uh, or raise your hand and I will answer it. Uh, but I, my mic is feeding back a little bit if I turn my sound on. So let's go with questions or any, uh, right now we have a grad student and undergrad. Uh, we have Dr. Knowles, so he's in political, or political science area, social science area, sociology, criminal justice. So if he has anything to add, I certainly would appreciate that. Let's open this up and see what we have. Questions or comments? This is Danielle. Hey, I would add also um, as one of the kind of library tips that I like to give students when we're doing uh, research together and I'm helping them through is one of the best things you can do is look to the end of your a source that you like. It could be a perfect source. It could be kind of on topic, just something that is close to what you want to say and look to the back because every um, every uh, uh, resource is going to have a bibliography, a notes, works cited, reference section at the end of it where they have taken all their information from and synthesized from. And a lot of times those sources are going to be useful or maybe even more useful than what you found in that one article. So go through and look at those names. And then also people like to write within their same field over a course of several years. So you can find research sometimes by the same author in multiple kind of uh, decades. And so they can have, you could be reading the beginning of the research, but you can also find stuff that they've published recently that's even more relevant to kind of the topic. Oh, thanks, Jesse. And then I kind of like the last little bit is so finding, you know, go to the reference section, look up the authors that you're using um, articles for but also see who has cited those articles. So you see who, kind of like the reverse of what I just told you to do is usually in a, um, so Galileo will have it, JSTOR will have it, even in Google Scholar. It's a little easier on Google Scholar. This is why I recommend Google Scholar for, is seeing who has cited that um, article that you're using in their own research right now. Oh yes, yes, definitely. Purdue Owl is always amazing. Like fourth tip. Dr. Knowles, do you have anything else to add from social sciences? Well, yeah, I would I would tell people to remember Purdue Owl. Uh, that is an outstanding source to keep you up to date on your style manual, whatever your style may be. They have a search engine there. So if you use some esoteric uh, style manual, you can still find it there and it'll help you get through proper citation. People overlook that all the time. So if you don't have the actual hard copy of the book laying on your desk like I do and like Dr. Lovern does, uh, Purdue Owl is, it'll save you bacon a lot of times. So go to that. Also, 
when you get your references together as you're gaining references, if you don't feel like you're getting enough and it's not deep enough, look at the works cited page on the back of that journal article or that chapter of the book, and that's a treasure trove of other information. So see what footnote four, if that is the passage that really intrigues you, see where footnote four leads you and go to that source and, and that'll give you a greater depth for that particular topic for your, for your paper or whatever. Uh, the only other thing I'd add is uh, stay within yourself in terms of organization. Some people use outlines. I use an outline, but I knew people in graduate school that use three by five or five by eight cards, and they would hand write out notes on these three by five and five by eight cards, especially with a complicated paper, and they would scatter them all over the desk or all over the dining room table or all over the floor and organize their paper thusly. So use something that works for you, but find uh, find a method that does work for you. And uh, the only other thing I would say is give yourself enough time. If you have a deadline on anything, give yourself enough time to go back and read it with fresh eyes. So whenever I have a deadline to a publisher, say on Friday of this week, I want that document to be finished probably Monday or Tuesday of this week so I can lay it down and not mess with it. As, as far as I'm concerned right now, it's complete. And then I'll go back on Wednesday or Thursday or maybe even Friday morning and go and make sure I have all the grammatical errors taken care of, all the spellings taken care of, all the commas where they need to be, everything cited properly. Just do one more walkthrough on the whole thing with fresh eyes. Don't run yourself up to a deadline. That's just silliness and it's stress inducing and you don't need to stress. So give yourself enough time to go back and, and perfect the paper with fresh eyes. And I can't think of anything else to add I don't, I, at this point, at least. But I am open to questions, so you can certainly contact me. You can email me at any time. I'm, e I'm easy to find over in Nevin, so happy to talk sure to you. It's easy to find. Down a secret hallway. You'll find it. Oh, on the topic of organization, that kind of brought up one of my uh, writing methods is because you're going to end up with a lot of quotes at the end, and sometimes you're not going to know what they're for or what to do with them. So I make sure to label each of my quotes as an idea that I want to express. Like this is the quote for idea one and all my idea one quotes are going into the same place. So that way you know what to do and it doesn't get too disorganized. Yeah, I think the key is uh, to find your pattern. I found a student this year had a wonderful uh, way of doing it. She took all of her articles and put them into a notebook and had an outline and she would highlight in different colors in the articles and then she would put a page number and the highlight color uh, in the outline so that she knew if she was just going to indirectly quote or, or directly quote. I mean, it was her own system and you have to find that. Uh, but there are some things that are easier than others. And if you don't know where to start, then you can start with one of these systems and then grow your own. And, and I think you have to find, you have to be in control of it. And it, writing is, is personal, but it's not your children. I just, I have to get that out there. It's not, you're not giving birth to your children. It is an assignment in undergraduates and you want it to be good, but, um, Critiquing something is going to make it better, and you have to remember that any critiques your professors give you are intended to, to up your skills, uh, not to hurt your feelings. And so you, you have to take a step back on that one. Um, but you can work with us here. Uh, that's what we're starting these brown bag lunches for. And you can build, and I, I love the fact that Jesse's here. So Jesse is uh, one of our grad students. She works with the Undergraduate Research uh, Council. So, Jesse, do you have anything that you want to add when moving from undergrad to grad? Um, can you hear me? Yes. The internet tends to be kind of uh, temperamental. Um, right now, I will tell you honestly, even as a graduate student, that this is very beneficial for me also because um, Trying to learn knowledge of using different sources and different citations and moving through all of it is very, very helpful because I am used to political science, but I don't want to close myself into just political science work cited. 
So um, I have enjoyed this just as much. And like Danielle stated, one of the things I discovered moving into the final year of my undergraduate is that when you look at the end of an article, there's like a it's like an explosion of resources that is just very beneficial. And if you just go down a rabbit hole clicking on resources and your mind can be blown. But um, one of the best things to learn as an undergraduate resources so that um, you're actually getting food statistics and true articles on all of that. And my professors were amazing at getting me that information and making sure I learned how to distinguish between credible resources. And I even have to brush up on that now when I'm going through resources. Yeah, it, it is helpful. I'm also adding my, uh, if anybody needs it, uh, my email because I'm happy to help. Uh, Naya, you haven't, you've been very quiet. Do you have anything you want to ask or you want to add? I don't want to put you on the spot so you don't have to. And you can just say no thank you if you don't want to. But if you have something, maybe you have a trick or two that we haven't thought of. I know you're in health sciences, so that's an entirely different field. I'll give you a moment while, while you're thinking about that. Um, one of the things I also want to mention is that there are different ways to go about writing in general. So when I write, uh, I have a tendency to want to write the whole thing at once. So I mess with my outlines and I mess with them and I, I have conversations with them. And, and then I sit down and I start writing. And um, fortunately, my family has been very cooperative, supportive. I don't want family. Uh, because once I start writing, I really don't want to be interrupted. I really need to sit down and get out what I had to say. Now, I am a person that has to rewrite multiple times. I will write and write and edit and edit and edit until I feel like it's, it's finally done. Um, but I don't like to be interrupted. <laughs> so, yes, I will sit down and, and maybe write for 12 hours, 14 hours straight. Um, on the other hand, I worked with a person and she didn't like to do that. She wrote three hours a day, three or four hours a day, and she was working on a project every single day, three or four hours every day, no matter what. Uh, to me, that didn't work, but for her, she's very well published, uh, great in her field, really respected, uh, and, and she was very careful about that. I know one person, it's almost annoyingly uh, good at writing, and when he writes, it, his first draft is almost always his, pretty much his final draft, and I find that annoying because I have to go through multiple drafts, but, you know, everybody has their skill sets and the things that work for them and work against them, and so you have to, to own your own skill set, and then writing is just a matter of increasing the skills that you're having problems with. That's all. It's just skills. It's not intelligence. It's not, I mean, some people might have talent. No, but I don't want to say that. But a lot of writing research papers is just practicing the skills. And it's something that even as professors, I just turned in a manuscript. Okay, it was really funny. I worked with these people forever. And I got this email back because they were like, so, are you using APA or Chicago? I said, well, I thought you wanted to use APA, so I was using that. And they said, well, halfway through your book, you switched to Chicago. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And sure enough, I had. So, you know, one of the problems with doing integrative studies and, and integrating knowledge is that if you use all the manuscripts, this is what you run into. Now they thought it was hilarious. And so it's getting fixed. But these things are going to happen, and you just, it's part of growing into your own voice, and that's what you're looking at. But you may be at the starting point right now. So take some of the tips, make them your own. Hopefully, you'll come back soon. All of you, and bring your friends. And Dr. Knowles, bring your, your friends that are colleagues and see if they'll come in and share their tips with us. And I'm hoping eventually that's what this is it's just a community people interested in research talking about things they do, giving tips, asking questions. Um, 
and that we can all get together and support each other in that way. So that's my final the end. Is there anything anybody wants to add before we let everybody go for lunch? Oh, glad, I'm glad, Naya, that they're helping you. I'm glad we could help. And you see all our emails in there. Please feel free, seriously, just to drop us a line. Those of us who are involved in undergraduate research, we love research. And we love to, to help students research. And we want them to be in the symposium in the spring and go to conferences if we ever get out of COVID, um, that kind of thing. We want you to have all of those experiences. So we want to help mentor you into them. So please contact us at any point. Jesse, you, you know where I am. <laughs> Get my email. And I've actually published with uh, Danielle and Dr. Knowles both. And, and so we're more than happy to help you with whatever we can. That being said, I thank you all for being here. And on behalf of the Undergraduate Research Council, I hope to see you in November with questions about your work.